So hi, I'm Mark Jamieson. This is the Insight Channel, and today I'm talking to Bill James from Attain, and uh, he's got a lovely um, description of what he does. It's um, you uh, work with people who don't like selling but have to anyway. Is that right? Mm. For people that don't like selling but have to anyway. Yeah. So um, that's me and probably 95% of the population. I hope so. <laughs> So um, I'm talking about insight, and uh, we've had many conversations. And one of the things that interested me is that you had a bit of a review of your business and was thinking about um, what you want to do and how you want to do it. And came up with this really interesting idea that you wanted a box. <coughs> yeah, um, it is interesting. Uh, we, don't, we don't have enough time. I, I'm a shocker at getting caught up in the do and not to think about the do. And uh, something I was doing over the Christmas period basically took me out of my business for four months and made me realize I actually didn't like my business anymore. And, you know, my first learning there is certainly you have to give yourself the headspace to step back and, and review fairly honestly and candidly so you can see what you like and what you don't like. And it led me to the realization for the last couple of years, I've actually just been making money to, to pay the bills and not much more, which is kind of sad. Um, so I came to two realizations. One, I was working on my own and I didn't want to. Uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a loner, I'm a team guy. And the second thing is I was running a business and I didn't want to. So, I mean, I have a business by default um, by virtue of the fact I'm proudly unemployable. Uh, I'm not sure where I would go or who I would work or who would put up with me. Um, so three-piece sales was the name of the company. And in another two or three weeks uh, at time of recording, we launch Attain. And that has got a partner in it who's given me a running mate. And I've got to say, that's given me a huge boost of energy. Uh, he's uh, 20 years younger than I am. And got, he just wants to run around everywhere and do everything, which is fantastic. Uh, and compliments me very, very closely. He loves the bits I don't. I love the bits he doesn't. Um, and then we've also, as part of that package, we've got a managing director. And the managing director will take all the rubbish away from me that I don't like doing and allow me the time and the space to actually do what I do like doing. And that's getting out, selling contracts, making contracts happen, multiplying businesses for people. Um, so, no, really, really enjoying that. I, I like your story because, uh, you know, a lot of people are, shall we call it, self-employed because they don't like their boss and they think that life is going to be fantastic if only they didn't have this person doing it. But I, I, I hear you're seeing that there could be some advantages to having a boss. Can, can you tell me more about that? Well, the, there's, there's an old thought process that says um, when you're not good at something, get better at it. But there is another thought process that says if you don't like doing it, get someone else to do it. And life is too short to spend a lot of time doing the stuff you don't like doing. Now I'm in business with my wife and she's very much um, on the accounting side of the business. She loves the logistics of it, um, putting programs together, formatting um, the workbooks, you know, really, really stamping a, a great look around our business. Me? Nah. So I'm, I'm really, really happy to have her. The other side of the business I don't look like doing is, is, it sounds terrible, but the planning, the strategy, uh, I'll, I'll often hire someone to come and strategize with me for a day and then I'll take that plan and I'll try and make that happen as best I can and then go back and re-strategize. But if I don't take the time out of my day and hire someone else to do it for me, it doesn't tend to get done and so I wander along. So all I've done is look at all the things I don't like doing, uh, which involves accounts and you know invoicing and... <laughs> <laughs> Those sort of things that any good professional speaker should hate. And I've given them to someone else. Uh, and they will keep me in the same way a dietitian keeps me on track. They'll meet me and sort of go, Bill, are you doing what you need to do? Are you sure we should be doing that? And those are things I'm not good at, especially as I do get very easily distracted by shiny things. I'm sort of off, ooh, you know, and I'm gone again on some tangent. And he's already brought me back a couple of times. And no, it's a good idea, but we'll just park it for the time being. And there's a part of me that's really rebelled, but I kind of know it's good for me. So he's process-driven, putting all the documents together, the manuals together, the processes together. He'll do all that stuff. Just take it all off me. And that leaves me with what I really do love, which is going out and finding clients, um, getting them on board as clients, and then making their problems go away. And, you know, bringing the, 
the sort of results that, that we enjoy. I was chatting to a client this morning. We've increased their business by a third. Now, I love that stuff. So how about I just make more time and go and do more of that stuff? It's how I generate the money anyway. And so I will generate far more than he will cost me. And it just, it just made so much more sense than me having to knuckle down and go, oh, it's admin day. You know, I, I don't have that anymore. So now it's all bright, shiny objects for me as far as I'm concerned. So what happened to good old-fashioned striving and hard work? Well, um, good is probably a word I wouldn't associate with what you just said, but accepted striving and hard work. I work hard, but surely it makes sense that I work hard at the stuff that, that I'm good at. I mean, you know, I, this is no different to getting rid of the $20 an hour jobs, not that an MD is $20 an hour. But, um, you know, if you can go and earn hundreds of dollars an hour, clear your plate and go and earn hundreds of dollars an hour. That just makes sense. Uh, there's no end of endeavor, believe me. And with my new partner on board, he's going to drive me too. And I'm good with that. I like working. I, I've never had a problem rolling up my sleeves and getting into it. In fact, I have a problem stopping doing that. But at least now I'm working with a passion, knowing what I'm doing. Uh, already, before we've even launched the company, we look at our pipeline and it's, it's already bigger than both our pipelines combined before. So the, the, the sum of the t- parts is truly a uh, far more significant total by the looks of it because cause there's someone to keep bouncing stuff off and, and, you know, I'm running against them. How'd you do this week? I got one of those. Oh, you got one of those. Well, that's better than my one, you know, um, which is happening plenty. He's, he's a great guy to have around. So it's still hard work. It's still striving. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm just not doing it in an area I hate. So this is about insight. And, and I like this story because, um, you know, there's many definitions of insight, but, but one is dealing with reality as it is, you know, allowing the actual reality to, to come through. Yep. You know, what I hear from many people who are sole traders, it's, it's hard having to do all these things uh, and feeling they have to, um, whereas it sounds like you took a reality check and said, you know, I want to focus on what I'm good at and find other yep. people. Of course, the interesting thing is that, you decided that you weren't good at being a boss. So how did you go about finding one? Did you um, interview? <laughs> no, um, it kind of came as a package. Now, my, my, my new partner uh, is already in a couple of other businesses with this person. And so there's already a very, very good working synergy between the two of them. So I could turn on one side and go, I was lucky. Or I could go the other way and go, well, you know what? When you put it out there, it comes back. Um, I went looking for a solution and happily got it in one one lump. Uh, I didn't have to go looking further than that. But that is not to say such solutions weren't there before. It's just to say that this time I was looking for them. Okay. And, 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 and again, this is the other, uh, you know, the other thing we, we learn about life is that there's opportunity everywhere. It's just what you spot as opportunity. So once I went looking for that, then I noticed it. I might have passed it by a dozen times before then, but not been ready to see it. Uh, so I, I think your solutions are out there. This one came in a nice neat package. Um, and I, I won't pretend we haven't rubbed each other the wrong way once or twice as I've wanted to do it one way and they've wanted to do it another way. Um, but it's structured so that, you know, their, their organization is, is half and my organization is half to make up the whole. Uh, then we just made sure there's a board with deciding votes in case we do get a tie, tied lock. And we're all big enough and ugly enough and recognise that we're there for the good of each other. Um, as I start moving towards retirement, and we all are, but sometimes you get closer than others, um, this, is, this is a solution that will generate a significant chunk of money when we sell the business in a period of time. Um, you know, and so it fits in with my overall plans as well. And, and so part of the planning is actually including my financial longevity into the future. It's all just become part of it. We just, I just put down my parameters and the managing director sat down and went, yep, I'll put a plan together. And he did. He came back and he addressed everything. So he that was the, great. So he put the plan together too. That, that's, that's good. Absolutely. Well, it was forming anyway. And when you get the right people, the gentleman I'm talking about recognizes the strengths that we've got as a pair and plans around that. And what he's actively trying to do and what he's been charged with doing is to strip away pretty much anything that um, 
gets in the way of us being at our best. And so he'll often come in and go, why are you doing that? That's not what you should be doing. Um, you know, and he'll pull it off us. And I don't know what he does to make it happen, but that's the joy, isn't it? I don't have to know anymore. But he's constantly coming and going, no, you're best here. No, no, you guys keep doing this. No, you go out there and find the business. Don't worry about that. I'll take care of that. So other than putting manuals and things together, there's not an awful lot of, of um, uh, any of that style of work anymore. And putting manuals and things together is actually a pleasure because it's all getting to know who we are. So it's all that fresh honeymoon period. But no, it, but it is working very well. And yeah. um, you go looking for what you want and you've got a pretty clear idea what it is. It's amazing how it turns up. Yeah, so I'm interested in that process because, you know, this, you know, by any measure is a pretty insightful thing to do. Mm -hmm. you know, and so I'm interested in the process by which you knew you had a problem and then how the, how the solution presented itself. Did this take a long time or a short time? Uh, quite a short time. And, and since it's very interesting because you're talking to someone who is uh, a through and through sales dog all my life. Um, if you throw in a sales bone, I've got to go and get it. I'm, I'm put together that way. And it was probably about two and a half, three years ago now, I realized that because I was always chasing, I was actually in a weaker position when I approached clients. So if you're approaching them all the time going, hi, would you like to talk to me? That's a different thing than if they sort of come to you and go, well, actually, Bill, we've heard you're good. Um, and it created an attitude change in my head, which was not easy to live with, considering how many years I had spent being a sales dog. Um, and that was very, very simply, uh, I, I stopped focusing so much on the numbers. That's not to say I don't know them, but I know that when I do the right things, the numbers actually happen. And I took the attitude that if uh, I, I will put myself in the way of opportunity rather than go and hunt opportunity. So I, I, I changed some of my modus operandi, but more than anything else, I changed my mental attitude and I put myself in the way of opportunity. And I simply had faith that if it was stupid enough to stick its head up, I was certainly good enough to go and get it. Um, and since I've done that, I found businesses actually flow more easily. It has allowed me to focus on where should I be so that when the opportunity does come, it's the right kind of opportunity. It's at the right level. Um, it's in a group where my skill set is instantly attractive. Um, and it's allowed me to also sit back and go, so what did I say that time that made all that difference? Uh, and so if I, as, I, as I'm chatting to a company and they go, oh, so what do you do? I say, well, have you got a highly technical sales team? Oh, look, I do, I do. Well, I'm guessing they probably know their business, their business backwards and they're absolutely passionate about what they do. But tell me if I'm wrong. Do they ever have any problems actually just getting out there and just promoting themselves? And they go, oh, you've got no idea my sales team. Uh, you know, well, I help people that don't like selling but have to anyway actually make that jump. Oh, do you? And when you're in your flow like that, it just, it just fits together in a way that people sort of go, well, that sounds like something worth having a cup of tea about. Um, and so I changed that attitude and I brought that attitude to this problem as well. I don't want to work. So do I get out of my business? No, I actually like what I'm doing. What don't I like? I don't like this. I don't like this. Who could do that? And it was, it was my, I call it my Bob the Builder philosophy. When you start asking questions, you, you start getting answers. And Bob the Builder has that theme tune. Can we fix it? Yes, we can. And I just literally, because I had that time out, I literally just sat there and, well, what do I need? If I could redesign my business, what would it look like? And I realized I wanted someone in it. I realized I wanted someone running it. Now, once I had that in my head and I went, right, that's what I'm looking for. It actually fell into place fairly quickly. I found my partner first. And then as we were discussing it, he went, oh, by the way, I actually already work with a guy who runs my other two businesses with me. We're shareholders. It's okay. Tell me about that. And bang, it was all there. So, I'd love to be able to give you a paint by numbers blueprint, but I think if you can have clarity about what you're looking for and be open to the fact that it's there for you to get, then um, the, I think that the the the, um, uh, the reality is that that it'll turn up for you. Yes, it seems that um, this idea of insight um, doesn't seem to work by paint by numbers or let's suddenly but no but make no mistake about the leap of faith it takes yeah yeah so but it is there but it seems to be more setting the conditions and allowing uh, as a, 
you know that if we do the right things we'll put ourselves in the right situation uh then things are going to occur to us um mm. as opposed to um I, I always remember this is one of my memories back in primary school uh, you know and, and the education system was all about learning these things and someone said right i want you to be creative your task now is to write a creative story, and and sort of sort of being struck with panic of saying, you, how how do you do that? You know, how do you just sort of turn that on? Look, and and the, well, we won't get into the education system, but it's it always amazes me that at six, when we say what happened in your holidays, we're going, oh, pirate ships and you know, huge imagination and everything from dragons too. Mm. By the age of eleven, you say to a bunch of kids, write about your holidays. They go, well, hang on, this is part of the curriculum. How many words do you want? Can I use my word processor? It doesn't seem to take long for the system to bring people into line like that, and it's a jolly shame because mm. um, the human brain's amazing. You just got to let it have its 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 way. Tell me about insight in the sales process. Um, gosh, that is a big one. Uh, there's, there is lots of insights in sales. I think when you consider how much sales has changed, which is all, of course, about the transparency that comes with being online, um, people are now at the stage where instead of going, gosh, I need one, I better go find someone to talk to. They're at the stage they go, I know I need one. I'll go and do my own homework. I've actually narrowed it down to two or three. Now I'll go for, so find someone to talk to. There's a lot of... Um, there's a change in the way you have to fundamentally work within the sales environment because if you go to someone and go, well, this is what you need. They go, no, I know what I need and I trust myself more than I trust you. Uh, you've got a problem. And so you actually have to become much more understanding of the human being now because you literally have to go back and go, actually, you've got it wrong, but have them thank you for saying that. And, you know, it's on the assumption they do. Um, there is a lot of change in, sales by virtue of the fact that a lot of people are now coming online but you can lose as many as 60 percent of your potential clients the first time they connect with a human being because the message is different because it's not what i want all i want is information and, and i'm not ready to buy yet but you're treating me like you want to close me there's there is a uh, there are some fundamental skill sets that have changed in that regard um and it's what salespeople have always been bad at, qualifying, actually asking people what they need and what they want. And none of it's a mystery. You have to just open your mouth and, and say to people, what would you like? In the actual sales appointment, um, if we're talking about New Zealand, very, very risk adverse. Very, very few people in sales actually even go near how the person feels about change. You lose most of your business to the status quo. Uh, just because, I, look, I, I hear it's good. We've got to plug it into our system. And the last time we did that, it was a disaster. And then I've got to retrain all my staff. And what if it doesn't work? You know, we do very little, uh, I find, in the sales area to cater to the fact that people have a little trepidation about change. And it's becoming more and more important to have um, a really relevant but deep conversation with people. People, are, people understand sales. Uh, I train young guys and ladies in sales and the people they're going to go see have been doing it for 20 years they're, they're just going to get absolutely minced if they think they can outplay a chess master so most of the people they go and talk to actually know far more about it than they do and so the answer is very simple have integrity don't ever trade your integrity you only get it once um be can and and be as be more open you think i work on the fact you should be real to who you are because frankly you can't be anyone else and you can be a third-rate plum, but you can only be a first-rate apple if you're an apple. Uh, and, and if someone doesn't like you for that, well, then they were never going to buy from you. You just sped the process up. You've got to relate to people so they want to buy. Uh, people don't tend to react well to have things forced at them. But some interesting studies are showing that you've got to be relevant. So when I go and see you, you've given me your time. I've got a very short period of time for you to sit there and make a judgment call on whether it was a good idea to let me in. So people no longer make a relationship for the sake of doing it. There's no, hey, how's your business so much? When you go in the first time, I'll often challenge. But I challenge with the idea of invoking deeper, more meaningful conversations so I can position myself general to general or as an equal. Um, but I need to go in there and show someone that I'm relevant to them before they want to make a relationship. Relationship's still important. But in a very time-poor world, 
people make a very quick judgment call whether they should continue a conversation with you. Are you relevant to what I want? You are relevant. Now I build a relationship. And it makes common sense when you think about it. You know, so, so those sort of nuances, we do a lot around the theatre of the sale. We do a lot around the person-to-person communication side. And it's where most people fail. They can get a sales process, they roll it out, and they go, I'm not getting success. Why is that? Because they're working here. Uh-huh. They're educating people. Man. Guess what? You, you buy from here. I'm putting well, my heart well, for anybody that's wondering. Absolutely <laughs> appointing, but I'm hoping. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. I'm just a little fellow, okay? No, no. Um, but that's people always have because when all said and done, whatever, whatever evidence you give me, whatever justifications you present to me, I still have a leap of faith at the end in believing you'll do it for me because no one shows bad case studies. You know, no, no one ever gives bad examples. Um, you know, I, as a speaker, if someone says to me, Bill, are you a good speaker? I don't go, well, I'm all right. You know, that doesn't get me the job. <laughs> but when someone hires me for a conference or they hire me to do training, and, and people often hire me for one or two years, you know, it's, when all said and done, there is a leap of faith going, I think you can help my team. I'm willing to sign the form and get on and do this. And that's not a head-driven thing. That's very much a heart-driven thing. Yeah, yeah. You were talking before about um, helping technical people sell. Yeah. And, you know, my background is in the IT industry. Okay. You know, it's quite interesting the number of situations where uh, in a product demonstration, a technical person is there to take the sale to the next stage, but, you know, without clear sales skills to do that. And Well, sorry. Oh, well, no. no, And so technologists are really good in the head. Yeah, I mean, that's where they make their money. Um, so so how how do we get across this idea of sinking into the heart? What's your, what's your take? Can I give you an example? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I need to get a bit of paper here and a pen. Okay. So let me do that. It says reaching curiosity for a bit of paper. Hold the line, Paula. How's your day going? That's the one. <laughs> so, and this is a random piece of paper that we have not prepared previously. Um, I will often, an example... I'll often use is one where we work with some uh, fire sprinkler engineers. And the call I'll very often get from the the management, the sales manager, director of sales, general manager, CEO, is can you show my guys how to close the deal? You know, they're really good at everything, but it comes to the close, they can't get it. And the answer is there's actually, the close is is the smallest part of a deal. People get really hung up on it, but in point of fact, it's it's just a part of the progression as you go through what you're doing. You know, we find you, we qualify, we understand what you need, we present a solution, we present it to the point where you go, actually, that looks really good. Okay, we'll sign the bit of paper. Now we start to put the solution together, we deliver that solution, we continue with the long-term relationship. The same is just the most logical small step in the process, but we get really hung up on it. And it's really bizarre that we do because the person that, that said yes, come see me, they actually know what you do for a living. Like they, they understand that you sell stuff. And so when they invited you into the office, knowing your company, knowing what you did, they actually expect you to try and present something. More than that, they wouldn't have invited you if they didn't have a problem. And if you don't at least try and solve that problem for you, why did you take their time? So, So we all get that at this end, but the person who sells, oh, no, I mustn't be pushy. I mustn't ask. It It actually makes no sense. And there's a whole heap around the psychology of that. So with the fire sprinkler engineers, they would get to a stage in the presentation and then suddenly they go, oh, it's sales time. And they would put a sales jacket on and change. (laughs) And what happens is the person they're talking to suddenly goes, what happened? We were getting on really, really well. Who's this person in front of me? What's going on? And they don't have to understand what that change is about. They simply react to it at a basic level and go, well, either they're not happy about the conversation, that maybe they don't trust what they're saying, they're nervous about something, and they pick up on that and they start going backwards at a rate of knots. So it wasn't about the clothes as such. It was about the confidence and all the other issues. So we gave them this very, very simple approach. We just took a bit of paper because people are also visual and they're also kinesthetic. And we drew on the piece of paper a very, very simple thing like that. We said, look, over here we have... of my time is actually about 
making sure I take care of fire sprinklers. I build them, we put them together. I don't pretend they're the cheapest in the market, so we let them handle price at the same time. I don't pretend they're the cheapest thing in the market. But 10 years from now, they're still going to look good. We are exceptionally good at putting fire sprinklers and things together. That's what we do well. Now, 3% of this is about me actually convincing you you should use me. And in that, I'm not so good. I'm actually a technician. I'm an engineer. And this whole sales thing has never sat that comfortably with me. So what I'd like to suggest is that we simply sit down and talk. I find out why you invited me here. What is it you're trying to achieve? What do you want to protect? What have you tried in the past? You tell me what you need, and I'll come back to you with some ideas. You can rip them apart. I'll put them back together again, and we'll get it to a point where you go, actually, that's not bad. Please don't expect some nice, smooth clothes. I'll simply ask you, so do you want one? And if you say yes, we'll get on with it. How does that sound? And so as an introduction, what it does is it aligns who they are with the process they've got to do. And bearing in mind they're talking to people that run warehouses, um, operations managers, chief financial officers, those sort of people who don't like being sold. They got on like a house on fire. Their sales went up 38% in three months. So, you know, having that sort of sales conversation is a much easier thing for a technical person to do than to, you know, try and become a salesperson. Does that make sense? No, absolutely. Uh, you know, one of the things, being an introvert myself yep. um, and looking at um, how introverts uh, communicate or sell, but um, apparently introverts are really good. Uh, Look, they are. You think of what an introvert does and you think about what people are asking for. Introverts are very good at asking questions, listening and finding solutions. They're very, very good at following up. Um, they're very good at explaining it so it's not hoodoo language. No one likes to be embarrassed by being overshone by a really smarty. And that's what you've got to work out and watch out. When you're a highly technical person, you get into your technical, and the person you're talking to isn't technical, and you can make them feel stupid or lose them. Um, introverts are incredibly good at actually caring for the customer. They're extremely good at following through, and then they're really good at customer service afterwards. What else do you want? You know, I mean, when you think about it, you don't want loud. Extroverts are very, very good at opening up doors and they're very, very good at pushing things to conclusion. And those are good, good uh, features to have. They're good characteristics to have. But when you talk to most people, they're very happy to deal with someone who's that slightly more introverted basis. And there is another thing called an ambivert, which is somewhere in the middle, which is that combination of being game enough to talk, but also quiet enough to listen. And, and that ambivert scale is, is a perfect one because it combines the two. So, yeah, very much so. We live in the age of the introvert. We live in the age of non-salespeople. It's a wonderful thing uh, because nobody wants to be sold. Um, so many people know more than you about selling. So, you know, I'm thinking about this reluctant salesman and, and that's what, who you deal with, isn't it? But, uh, to yeah. a large degree, yeah. Normally they're on the technical side. So uh, we've done some great things in the trades. Uh, we do a lot of stuff in financial services, accountants, lawyers, engineers, um, people who have a technical background. Uh, at the moment, I'm working with companies who are in fuel, ho hoses, um, farm machinery, uh, agriculture and fertilizer. They're all technical areas where people have to know their stuff, but they also have to know how to knock on a door and actually ask someone if they would talk to them, please. You know, and, then, and then make things go forward. But they can do it in their own way. So a big part of what we do is we align the person with the job they've got to do in a way they're comfortable to do it. Um, our, our main program is called Sales from the Comfort Zone because these are people that won't easily or happily leave the comfort zone. So one of the things I talk about in the book is uh, when you look at how you can equip people, um, you can give them tool set. Yeah, you can put them on a CRM system. Um, you can start looking at your sales funnel and, and all of those good things. Yep. Um, you can give them a skill set, you know, which is things that you do or respond or how you answer questions. And you can also address their mindset, which is about what's going on inside. I'm interested in your view. Which, which do you work with? What's the most powerful? Uh, look, you've got to have the skill set. But if I was to sort of have a test at the beginning of a program about do you know what to do, are you willing to do, 
the vast majority of people would actually pass the I know what to do and they would fail the I'm willing to do. Ah, so what's happening there? <laughs> well, look, it's just I don't like selling. Um, if, you, if you ever do any marketing, write the word you want to explore down on a bit of paper and surround it with other similar words and you'll find out whether it's a good one. Write the word salesman down and ask people to throw other words at it. And you can imagine what you get back is not very complimentary, everything from sharky to pushy to, you know, used cars to medallions, white shoes. There's all sorts of stuff comes back. And very rarely I get someone goes, professional, you know. So if, if you think about it at a very basic level, from a very small age, most people are told that salespeople are rat bags. Um, and so you grow up having it reinforced all the time you know watch out for the salesman watch out for you know and i say salesman not to be sexist but but the reputation was gained in the aluminum siding sort of days uh when it when it was a male dominated uh, industry now if you've got that internal feeling and someone suddenly turns around and goes i want you to become one of them you you have to expect some pushback from that little voice but we don't like them we don't trust them why would we want to be one and so you have to understand why, you know, people have to align. Um, there was a time back in 87, yes, I'm really that old, um, where I had loads of redundancies and I was a debt collector. And if you, I, I know here you only see a head, but if you were next to me, you realise I'm about five foot seven. Collecting cars in South Auckland in the middle of the night was what I did. And, and pretty obviously an underwhelming specimen. Um, but the way I collected cars... 17 out of 20 people actually got their cars back. I saved them the collection money. I drove them back to the office and explained how they could get their cars and how this all worked. I got thank you cards from people, uh, you know, and I collected their car. And everybody poked borax at me going, hey, you're not doing the job right. And yes, I was the number one collection agent. Why? Because people didn't hide their stuff from me. They actually sort of, you know, I remember once getting a phone call going, oh, I've got to have my car over. Could you come get it? Look, I'm sorry, I don't work for them. Oh, so, you know, why do I tell this story? Mm. It was, please excuse the French, a rat bag job. I didn't have to be a rat bag doing it. And anybody out there who's in a sales role chooses how they act. And for all the training they might get when they're on their own in front of a customer, they have absolute license to, to act within their own levels of integrity. That's not to say you hang your company out to dry by telling every single home truth. Uh, but uh, I'm working with one particular person at the moment and uh, it's, it's with an online marketing aspect and they're going to do Google Analytics and Google AdWords. And the person wants to pay four or five hundred bucks to do that. And they're going, it's not enough. It's not enough. It's OK. So what's the answer? I'm going to go back and tell them it's not enough. OK, there's integrity in that. I have no problems with it. How about this? Go back and say to them, look, we're very, very happy to do your analytics at the four or $500 mark. Here's where we feel the limitation sits at that dollar value. We would be certainly more confident in the outcomes we can produce at, say, $1,000 a month, and we'd like you to consider that seriously. Having said that, if you want to start on that dollar value, we will certainly do it for you. But we need to just give this warning as well. Now, that's a, that's, that addresses the need without shooting the deal. Uh, and it's just how you phrase it. It's just how you, you find that wordage. And people respond beautifully to that. Go, okay, I appreciate the integrity. I can't go above 500. Do you think it's worth doing? Uh, look, I have to say it's worth doing because this is what I do. And I do think we'll get you some good results. I just know that for double the money, you'll triple the results. So why don't we start at the 500 and see how we go? But with that proviso. So it's not, it's not a hard thing to do. Uh, you just have to have a little thought about it. And most people just go, oh, I just can't do it. Well, yes, what's, what's that about? You know, because you make it seem so straightforward. Well, that's the neck. I mean, that, that's why people hire me, because I say it in a way people go, well, I don't mind doing that. It doesn't sound like sales. It's simply, it's simply repositioning some stuff in your head. Um, you know, like with those engineers, when we showed them that very simple technique, they went, oh, I don't mind doing that. That doesn't sound like sales. Um, we did some referral work with one of the bigger insurance companies here and we had their very top advisors and only 6% of them asked for referrals, which makes no sense, but there you go. Why? Oh, I don't want to risk the relationship. Um, no, no, I don't want to be pushy in that regard. Sorry. I mean, they trust you to run, you know, insure their business. They trust you to look after their family if things go wrong and you can't say, you know, anybody else that needs what I do. So, 
this is again is the power of the word. We said to them, well, we've got a recommendation program that's very, very similar, but it's a little bit lighter weight. Would you like to start with that one? Oh, that one will do. So we got that little toolbar thing at the top of the, the top of the screen that you have that says replace word. And we took out referral, we put in recommendation, we rolled it out, and we went, this is a great program, I can do this. The human brain is a very strange little thing. You know, it, it trips itself up all the time. Hmm. And so you have to do a bit of work around, you know, um, that Bob the Builder thing. Don't say, I, I can't do sales. You've got to ask the question, well, if I had to do sales, how could I do it so it wouldn't impact too much on my preconceived ideas and my, my internal values? Well, am I willing to change the values? Not really. Okay. Am I willing to explore how my values could be maintained and make sales? I could do that. What do you have in mind? Well, as soon as you ask questions, um, a piece of marketing we did for um, blood services, they would put up a poster wherever they went in the large government departments. And I can't give you numbers, it's their business. But they would put up their blood donors this day, this time, this place, and they'd get a certain number. All we did was put at the top of the poster, will you be there? And what happens then is that people look at the poster and at the top it goes, will you be there? They read the detail and they make a decision right there. Will I be there? Yeah, I should probably go to that. And the numbers went up markedly. And again, I say it's, it's their business, so I can't really give you that. Mm. But it was significant, you know, like more than half. And uh, all we did was add a question. When you add a question to the human brain, as a natural tendency, it tends to want to find you an answer. When you give a statement, I know good at sales, it goes, okay, got that. I'll make sure that happens too. So a big part of the process is to sit there and actually explore and, and again, align who they are with what they've got to do. You don't have to change the process significantly. You just have to show them how to fit it to them. You know, it's still the same pair of shoes, but you can put inner soles in that make it much more comfortable. Um, and that's a lot of a large part of what we do. Yeah, Bill, I never know where a conversation is going to go because I was going to ask you about your insights, but there's plenty there, isn't there, about the reluctant salesperson or oh, yeah. framing or um, I like the way you make it easy. You know, the answer is not throwing yourself against something, but simply some small little mindset change. Is that right? But uh, what I'm hearing is aligned with your own, your values. Is that is that what people are fearing? That uh, particularly in the work environment, that they have to be inauthentic, or they feel they have to be inauthentic to be in sales, and you show them oh, very much. You very show much. them a way that they can still be who they are, and yeah. Have to do. And and look when you when you when you unpack that for people, you also have to you have to show them how that works. It's no good going. Oh no, it's okay. Just be yourself. You have to sort of go. So what are you good at? Okay. Um, to give you the, the most wonderful example, one chap we worked with um, who had this shock of grey hair and teeth missing and a very strong Italian accent um, was very conscious about the Italian accent and what have you. And, you know, he, he, he went into a cold call to, and, and he was working in the, the, the snack box industry, you know, where you put $2 in, you pull out the snack. And he'd walk up and go, would you like a, a snack solution to try? And people go, it just sounds so exciting. Um, <laughs> a snack, <laughs> a snack solution. Yum, yum. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, but what we did is we got him to embrace the fact instead of, it's not, oh, look, they don't understand me because I haven't got very good English. We switched that around in his head, gave him a good haircut, gave him some, you know, clean apron and, and a different attitude and say, look, if people don't understand Italian, you know, they don't understand your accent, then obviously they don't have enough love in their life. Now, bearing in mind that receptionists were his main characters, he started sort of humming opera as he walked up the stairs and, you know, hello, you know, da -da -da, and they said, look, sorry, I'm, I'm finding it a little difficult to understand you. Ah, uh, that's because you don't understand the language of love. And brought out this really lovely character in himself that changed everything. And he was, without a shadow of doubt, 10 times more successful opening those doors because he was a character, because he was relaxed, um, because he was allowed to be himself. He was just having some fun with it. And instantly he became a more attractive character to a receptionist that deals with all sorts of people all day. Uh, and so, you know, just, just allowing him to do that it made all the difference in the world to his process, his sales, his enjoyment. 
uh, and suddenly bang he's much more successful he was literally putting in eight nine ten times as many uh, snack solutions as he was before just because he was being himself so sometimes you've got to work harder with people than others to, to let them see that this is something they can do um, but most people understand it's part of their job we we, we say look the, the first the first thing you've got to do, we have three C's. You've got to commit to the fact you're in sales. You don't have to like it. But I can't teach you to swim a better way if you don't think you're swimming. You know, so accountants, for example, we do a lot of work with them. And I'm sorry if there's any accountants listening. But a lot of them go, look, I don't need to sell. I don't want to sell. So do you ever talk to new clients? Oh, yes. And what do you do? I just find out what they need and offer them a solution. And what happens then? Well, they hire us. And you think you're not selling. You know, but, but they have this, no, 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 no. No, I don't want to do that. Well, yeah, there's no, nothing they don't want to know what I've got if they don't think they're swimming. Yeah, it seems there's this image of a salesman as this person who sweeps in and either charms or snarms or, or does something, whereas in fact sales is a way of life and an influence in an organisation. Uh, yeah. you know, I hear some people say we're always selling because we're influencing. Well, look, you've got your, your insight uh, program running here. Aren't you trying to show people it's a great thing to log into? Aren't you trying to give them value? In point of fact, you're selling your insight concept by interviewing me and putting it up there and hoping that people will come and listen to it and go, I'm going to listen to another one. What this guy's doing is good. Who's this Jameson character? Oh, I've been rumbled. But actually, as I said, I, I'm, you know, this, this, is, this is my new thing. I'm just going to talk about insights and smart things that people come up with all day, and I'll be perfectly happy. And there is actually a few things that you can do to um, create that environment. And you know, I, love, I loved hearing these things. I mean, this is, um, this is a big business issue, as, as you know. This is, uh, you know, if you go and talk to anybody who's running a company, they'll be talking about their sales performance and the performance of their salespeople and how they can make it better. And, and I'm hearing some really good, um, really good useful insights there. It makes me want to go and look at my call list. And, <laughs> Well, look, if you do, let, let me, use, I guess we're starting to wind up, but let me give, leave you one last thing. Um, even when I was selling insurance, goodness knows those days, I would turn up and I'd go, look, let me give you my card. You'll see on there it says I'm an insurance salesperson. Now, that means I'm actually here to sell you insurance. It's what I do for a living is how I feed my family. But I can't sell you anything you don't want. I've got to come up with a strong enough point for you that you go you know i think i need that i think i can afford that and i think i'll do that so while this is what i do for a living it has to be done in a way that you're happy to be part of it now you know putting the honest intent out there it doesn't get more basic than that you know they know why i'm there they made the appointment but it's amazing how it just relaxes the whole environment when you instead of hiding it you front it uh, it, it just it's, it's a standard part of our approach now. Hi, look, Bill James, thank you very much. And look, I'm here to see if I can interest you enough that you might use us for some of, your, some of the services. But obviously, we need to have a talk about that first, and you need to be happy with that as an idea. And that's a very common way we show people that they should start their conversations. And they come back all the time going, you'd be amazed. As soon as I say that, people go, ah. Oh. <laughs> and and it, it's just the, the heat goes out, that the tension leaves because you're putting on the table that which we all know but we don't want to admit. And by doing that, it can flow from there. You can have that conversation. You can relax the situation. And that is actually how simple it can be when you understand a little bit about the head. Oh, it's, uh, it's great. And, you know, um, you're, you're giving me all my trigger words, you know, which is ease and flow and connection. And, you know, as well as having smart ideas, it's just a nice way to be. Agreed. Yeah, it's much more pleasant. I'm a nice guy. I mean, I work on the emotive side and um, I'm not pushy in any way, shape or form. So I've had to learn over the years, if I don't want to be pushy, how do I still get the sales on board? And I do set sales records. Um, and even when I am persistent, people go, you know, you, you are persistent, Bill, but you're good at it. And no one minds. Um, and it's just how you do it. So happy to show anybody that's interested. But, you know, there we go. Right. So a final question for you, Bill. Hmm. So at the end of our conversation, we were talking about insight. But I'm curious as to what's the biggest insight you've ever had in your professional life? Well, again, I, I have to say and admit that I'm not very good at taking time out of my business. So sadly, my greatest insights have come when I've had enforced things happen. 
So uh, when my life partner suddenly become very ill or when I've had five stents put in my heart and I'm suddenly going, wow, I'm mortal, um, the greatest insights have sort of come in, in those regards. On my private life, I'm reasonably open anyway. I'm reasonably forthright and, and say what he's saying. Uh, probably the biggest one was what got me into speaking in the first place. I was uh, running a very, very successful insurance brokerage and had five cents put in my hat because I was also doing a charitable uh, organisation that was putting families in their own homes in South Auckland and put it all together. It was just too much for my body. And so I had this huge realisation and for me personally, I did the Roger Hamilton Wealth Profile. Um, I don't get paid for that endorsement. But it showed me that I was a deal maker. It showed me that I was a star type personality that liked to be in front of people. And I had scholarships in my teenage years for acting and singing. And it showed me I was a supporter profile first and foremost. And so it, it let me sit down and go, so where do I find the star bit? Where do I find the deal maker bit? Where do I find the supporter bit? And suddenly I find myself on a stage in front of you know, up to a thousand people sometimes helping them be better at something they don't like doing and as part of that i have to go to companies and actually put deals together and, and take company clients on and so one of my biggest ahas was getting into speaking in the first place because it ticked all those boxes i love helping people i really really do uh, but this was a way that i could help literally hundreds of people at a time um, and that was a massive aha moment in my life and you know even now looking at the change in my business now, I very soon got past that, do I just get out of this business? The answer was no, I like what I'm doing. I'll do this quite possibly to, you know, well beyond 65, 75, whatever. I don't see me not helping people. So the biggest aha moment there dragged me out of selling insurance and into a very, very different lifestyle. And I relished it. Six figures in the first year, went for it. And um, that's probably the number one in my life because that allowed me a whole restructure from that point on it was six seven weeks a year off and you know good money coming in and and, and i've grown from there um but the satisfaction in helping those many people i get such a lot of enjoyment out of having someone say i did it i did it i've never been able to do it before but i did it and that really spins my wheels and as long as it keeps spinning my wheels i'll keep doing this wow Thanks, Bill. You know, it's good to talk, and uh, I never know what we're going to end up talking about, but there's <laughs> such a power of information there. Um, so uh, so thank you. Um, I'm going to run that little banner at the end of this video, so if you want to get hold of me, if you want to contribute to the Insights book, if you want to get hold of Bill, um, even if you're reluctant, uh, then uh, I'll have those details there. So, uh, so thanks very much. Absolute pleasure. Cheers, mate. Thanks.